Good evening and welcome to World Changers Bible Study. We are excited to have you join us this evening for our study. And it's great to know that we are able to come together 7.30 every Wednesday evening. And we are able to sit around God's word and we are able to look for ways that we can apply this word to our lives. If it's the first time that you're joining us, we want to direct you to our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. Just check out what we've been doing in ministry up to this point. If it's the first time that you're joining us for this series, you've missed a bit already, but you can always go back and check and see what we did prior to this session. We are looking at mobilizing believers for ministry. I believe that this is an extremely important topic, mobilizing believers for ministry. I believe that if every believer becomes mobilized for ministry, you know, we would be astonished at what the church is able to accomplish in this earth. If we can just get the concept of being the body of Christ, um, to resonate in our spirits, we would turn this world upside down. And so I want to challenge you to stay with us, um, even as we look at the magnitude of ministry. Now, this is the second session in uh, under this subheading. Um, we would have looked at the myths of ministry and we debunked a lot of those myths in our first um, segment of three sessions. Then we looked at the might of ministry, the, the capacity, what might, what, what uh, ministry is able to accomplish. And under this section, we are looking at the magnitude of ministry. Last time, we looked at the what of ministry as we looked at, at its magnitude, um, how broad it is, how wide it is. Um, so we looked at formal ministry and informal ministry. The fact that ministry is not just done um, in a church setting, in a service, but ministry is done um, wherever God's people go um, in formal settings and in informal settings. And so we want to continue today um, to look at the who of ministry. We looked at the what of ministry. Today we're looking at the who of ministry. Who does it involve? And that's very, a very important question for us to consider. I just want to remind you though, just before we jump into our session, that if you have questions, Please send your questions to cogsilversands at gmail.com. cogsilversands at gmail.com. We would be uh, delighted to take your questions and have a look at them and then come back and share those answers in our session. We've been looking at questions because regularly what we would do is we would have an interactive segment. We were unable to have those interactive segments at the moment. And so in their absence, we were having some Q&A time. And so we want to encourage you to just send your questions, cogsilversands at gmail.com. So who is ministry for? Um, the who of ministry. I want to say that ministry involves every person who is a Christian. If you are a Christian, you should be involved in ministry. Ministry is for every single child of God. Um, if you are God's child, you have been saved to serve. And service is ministry. And every Christian is then, by virtue of the fact that uh, we are saved to serve, every Christian is then a minister because we are saved so that we can minister. We can be God's hands and feet. We can be the body of Christ doing everything that Jesus would do if he were bodily present on the earth. And the verses that we have been focusing on bear this out very well. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to spend some time in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read some of those verses in a bit, but I just want to encourage you to spend some time reading 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is such an instructive passage of scripture as it relates to ministry, as it relates to spiritual gifts, as it relates to functioning as the body of Christ. A good reading, a good study of 1 Corinthians 12 is essential for every believer. We've been delving into it. We've broadened it. We've looked at a number of themes coming out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But this has been um, our key chapter as we look at mobilizing believer for believers for ministry. But yes, ministry involves every believer. Every believer is saved to serve. 
So, so service is ministry. And every Christian is a minister. I, I like Ephesians 2 10, which says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Good works, obviously, of ministry. Um, we are his workmanship, which means that um, God has designed us. Workmanship speaks um, of design. It speaks of a finished product. Um, that thought has gone into the production of this particular item. It means that it's not just work. It's not just something that is done, but it is something that is done with a measure of finesse. Um, that thought um, and, and creativity has gone into its construct. And so when, 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 when the Bible says that we are his workmanship, it is saying then that God has designed us. Um, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good work. So God has designed you, my brother, and God has designed you, my sister, to do good works of ministry. Designed you, which means that he's given you the gifts that he wants you to have. He is giving you the, the various abilities that he wants you to have, um, that, that, that he has allowed you to have certain experiences because these experiences help you with ministry. He's um, blessed you with a particular kind of personality and he's given you passion about certain areas of ministry because he wants you to have the heart for it. All of this is how God has um, allowed his workmanship to be accomplished in our lives. First Peter 4, it says, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Another instructive verse, every man hath received the gift, every man, every man, even so use the gift that you've been given to minister. Don't try to minister where you are not gifted. All of this is in this text, you know. Don't try to minister in places where you are not gifted. Minister where you are gifted so that the body can do its work in completion. Minister the same to one another as good stewards. You're only going to be a good steward of your gifts if you use those gifts that you are given. If you're trying to use other gifts, it means that the ones that you are given are going to be neglected. And it speaks of the manifold grace of God. Um, and when I, whenever I see grace connected to God, it is saying that these are things that we received that we didn't have to work for. You didn't work for the gift. It was given to you. It was bestowed upon you. God gave it to you. And the Bible says that in 1 Corinthians 12. He gives the gifts severally and as he wills. So, so don't think that you look at something and you think, okay, this, this looks attractive. It looks interesting. I'm going to do that. No, see where God has gifted you and serve there because that's where um, you're going to be able to bless the lives of others because you're operating in your area of giftedness. So um, let's talk a bit about who does ministry involve. We said it involves every Christian, but let's just break this down a bit. I want to say that ministry involves children. Children. I, I believe in children's ministry. And, and we need to teach our children to understand and appreciate ministry. And we need to encourage them to become involved in ministry. So when a, a child gives um, his or her life to Jesus, Jesus wants to use them. Jesus wants to use them. You, you, you don't give your life to Christ at 10 years old and, and have to wait until you're 21 to be used of God. If, if you give your life to Christ as a child, he wants to use you um, in your childhood. When, when we read the Bible, we see that Josiah became king at the age of eight. And the Bible tells us that when his reign ended, he was 39 years old. He, he So all the years of his reign would have been as a young man. And, and the Bible tells us that God used him to reform the nation of Israel. Um, there was a revival that took place um, in the land of Judah under his reign um, because he, he submitted himself to God. I believe he had persons around him who would have given him guidance and support um, as, as, a, as a child, but, but God was able to use him and through his reign as a child. Imagine taking on a nation at eight years old. That's the time when you want to be running around and playing with your friends. But, but um, God anointed him for this special task. Um, the Bible also tells us that the child Samuel served God in the temple. 
No, no, we don't know all the things that Samuel did, but he served God in the temple when he was a child. I want to say to us, if you are listening to me and, and you have children in your church and these children express a desire to serve the Lord, let them serve the Lord. Um, people are going to be blessed and touched and ministered to um, by these children. This child, Samuel, who served God in the temple while he was a child, grew up to become a great prophet. He was the one who anointed David to be king. Um, so I believe that when a child uh, expresses a, a desire to follow Jesus, it should be encouraged. When a child makes a decision to follow the Lord, it should be encouraged. Um, there are times when people discourage children um, who, who say, I want to be baptized. I, I, I have accepted Jesus. I want to be baptized. And people say, oh, you're too young. You don't know what, what you're talking about. You don't know all those things. Um, I want to say that if a child makes a decision to follow Jesus, let the child follow Jesus. And you'll be surprised to see that God will be able to take that child and use that child in ministry. Um, these children are sometimes able to do things that many adults can't do because Sometimes we don't have the energy to do it. Um, ch children can be taught how to do a lot of things in ministry. They can talk how to do formal outreach to other children. They can share um, Jesus with other children. Um, they can be used to minister to seniors, to go when, when a visitation team is visiting seniors, and seniors love to see children. It, it gives the children an appreciation um, for the seniors, and, and they can sing for them. They can bring them joy and delight. Um, we are saying that children can be used of God, children's choirs, children's bands, um, all kinds of areas. And it's important also that we don't make the mistake of thinking that a Christian child is a miniature Christian adult. Because sometimes we get um, carried away with the idea, this child accepted the Lord, they're baptized. They're not going to be a mini adult. They're not going to be a miniature Christian adult um, simply because they accepted Christ and they are baptized. They're still going to be a child. And remember what Paul said, when I was a child, I thought, as a child, I reasoned as a child, I understood as a child, I behaved like a child, and it was only when I became an adult that I put away childish things. Um, so, so we need to allow the children to grow up. We got to allow them, if they're young people, we got to allow them to be young people. If they're children, we got to allow them to be children. The, the world, though, makes space for its children. The world has all kinds of activities that encourage their children to perform, to display their skills, to get involved in all kinds of activities. And I believe that following the example of Christ, we should embrace our children. Um, we should lead them um, to follow Christ and we should lead them to serve in ministry wherever God bestows gifts upon their life. So I want to say that beginning on that end of the spectrum, and we are talking about the fact that ministry is for everyone, we need to be able to allow our children to minister. God is not going to wait until they become adults to use them. He'll use them. Um, if they are his children, he'll use them now as children because they will have a uniqueness about them and their ministry um, that will not be evident in any other season of life. I also want to say that ministry involves youth. Um, and it's important to understand that God doesn't have a problem with youth. He doesn't have a problem with young people. Um, in fact, I think that he has high expectations of them. Um, and you would realize that um, in scripture, some very important tasks were assigned to young people. A very important tasks. It, it was the young man called Joseph who was given the responsibility of managing the largest economy in the ancient world. Imagine a young man, not from Egypt, from Canaan, but he's come to Egypt um, and he has grown in stature to the point that he is now placed in a position to manage the largest economy in the ancient world as a young man. Um, God strategically placed him there um, so that um, the, the, the nation, his nation could live. Um, they could have life because he was there uh, placed by God 
um, for that particular time and season. It, it was a young man called David who rescued the Israelites from a giant called Goliath. When everyone else was running away, um, he, he had the, the determination and tenacity and mind to, to battle the giant and to defeat him. Um, he, while he was still a young man, was anointed to become the second king of Israel. Um, Joshua was still a young man when he was entrusted with the responsibility of providing leadership um, for um, the, the, the children of Israel, and he led them to great heights. The apostle Paul um, also said words to a young man who was his mentor. His name was Timothy, who was entrusted with leadership and responsibility in the church. And Paul said to him, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but be an example in conduct, in speech, in love, and in purity. And then the Bible says God calls young men because they are strong. So, so youth is really a time when you have a lot of energy to get the job done. Um, young people are creatives. They're very creative. And this, this many times can lead to enhancement in areas of ministry. You realize that as you get older, um, you, demands of life um, sometimes cause time to become scarcer. It doesn't change the amount of time that there is. But it sometimes changes the amount of time that you have for certain things. Family life and careers impact on the avail availability of time. So young people really have an advantage. Um, life becomes more complicated as you get older. Remember the wise man Solomon when he said, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Um, and, and, and he talks about before the evil days come, before, before life gets complicated, you know, while you are young. Remember your creator. Devote yourself to him. Um, you, you know, delve into areas of ministry where you know you are called to serve and give of your best, the best of your time. Because a time will come when you're not going to have as much time available as you have now. Pour your energy um, into ministry because a time will come when you're not going to have as much energy as you have now. And, and God is calling young people to ministry today. He is requiring the same faithfulness and the same holiness from them. He, he still wants their lives to be um, lives that are surrendered to him. Um, so, so youth is not a time to be reckless and irresponsible. Um, Christian youth are expected to dare to be different and to set a standard of righteousness, even if it caused them ridicule and scorn. Um, but know that God is going to walk with you. And when you devote your life to him, um, your life doesn't become free of regrets. But God charts a beautiful path and a beautiful future for you because you devote your life to him. So, so we need to um, encourage our young people to get involved in ministry. Demand the same excellence from them of lifestyle and the same excellence um, in terms of stirring up their gift and using it that we expect from everyone who wants to uh, minister for God. But yes, young ministry is for young people. Ministry is for adults. Remember we talked about Paul saying, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and so on. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The, the, you, you'll become a man, you will grow up. And, and a, an adult is someone who has reached a certain level of maturity. Um, usually mature enough to lead a family, mature enough to handle a job, to be settled in a career. Um, an adult understands life because they have worked through the challenges of childhood and youth. And they have now moved past those stages and they're into the stage of adulthood. They have matured. But, but the adults are the ones who make the world work. Um, they are the ones who, because they're into careers, because they're into um, various services across um, nations, they make the world work. And, and guess what? They make the church work as well. Now, um, somebody would say, but I thought the Holy Spirit is who makes the church work. Yes, he does. But, but we're, we're looking at this now from a human standpoint. Um, because adults are the ones who have the know-how, who have the skill, who bring the, uh, the stability that we need in churches to get churches to work. So adults are like the engine that the church needs as they have the knowledge and resources that make things happen. 
All right. Um, and you just need to look at um, the average church and look at how committees are comprised. When you when, when you want stability, when you want persons who are going to who will be resourceful and all that, you know that you need to get some adults there because they are the ones who are going to make things work. Um, adulthood presents you with opportunities um, to minister, for instance, like a parent. And parenting is a ministry. I, I am not sure, but I, be, I believe that there are persons who may never have considered that parenting is a ministry. Um, but parenting is a ministry. It gives you an opportunity to minister to children. And then those children get the opportunity then to minister to others. Um, have a look at the instruction that God gave to the parents in Israel. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words I commanded this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently unto your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Bind them as signs on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. That's an instruction for parents. And, and so, um, as parents, you are provided with a wonderful opportunity of being able to pour the truth of God's word into your children. That's a ministry. That's a ministry. You'll also be provided with opportunities to minister, for instance, at your workplace. And we talked about formal and informal ministry. Um, you, you also have the advantage of being able to have younger people look to you for counsel and guidance and advice. And, and older people depending on you for help. So you are right there in the middle, like the engine making things happen. There are those who are looking to you for guidance and help. There are those um, who are older, who need you for the stability that they need in their lives. Um, and so ministry for adults, um, ministry is for adults, rather, because they have the maturity and stability. Um, it's that maturity and stability that they bring to the kingdom of God that make them a real significant asset to God and to his kingdom. And then ministry is for seniors. Ministry involves seniors. Seniors are persons who have significant experience, um, who have wisdom, wisdom, who have knowledge. Um, and, and, and yet this too, seniors have time to devote to ministry. So it's like when you get to the extremes, the children may have some time and the seniors also have some time because um, a lot of seniors are sometimes retired from work. Um, as a result, they'll have some time to dedicate to service. There are times when some seniors are given the responsibility of grandparenting um, and they have, they have to take on certain roles that may take, take up some of their time. It also keeps them young and so on, but they, they have time. Um, and, and a person should never think that they're too old to be useful in the kingdom of God. Just like we are saying that children shouldn't think that they're too young to be useful in God's kingdom. Seniors should never think that they are too old to be used in God's kingdom. Um, you, you, you should never think that, um, you know, you are now past the time when you can do something for the Lord. Understand that God can use you at any age. And I believe that churches that have seniors in their midst have a wealth of resources and wisdom among them. Um, that's something that we should rejoice about. Um, that we can do multi-generational activities because we have people across the spectrum. We, we can benefit from this kind of ministry because we have persons who have been there and done that. Persons that we can lean on for their wisdom and lean on for their knowledge, lean on for their experience. Seniors should be involved in ministry. Now, now the Bible says that when Joshua was old and well advanced in years, the Lord said to him, you are very old, but there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. In other words, in other words God saw him as being old but still capable of overtaking land. land. Um, when Caleb was 85 years old, he said, Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. 
85 years old, but he's still ready to drive out the Anakites. Um, the word of the Lord also posits that the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar in Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God and bring forth fruit even in their old age and remain fresh and green. You know, um, today many people are living longer. And, and the percentage of elderly persons in many congregations um, seems to be rising. Um, and ministry to seniors, as well as ministry by seniors, needs then to be a priority among um, the people of God. So, so as a senior, you may not move at the same speed. Um, you may not see as well as you were able to see physically before. But, but you, you may not have eyesight, but you have insight. Because God gives you a, a degree of wisdom because of everything you've gone through that the rest of us may not have. So, so where eyesight is missing, insight takes over and you are able to pour into the lives of others because of all that God has given to you. So it's important that, that we acknowledge this. You know, the saying goes that age is just a number. And sometimes it's tragic that, you know, after persons reach a certain age, they wonder if their usefulness is over. But so many amazing things happened um, to individuals way past um, the age of retirement, way past the age of, let's say, 65. Galileo made some of the greatest scientific discoveries at the age of 73. John Glenn returned to space at the age of 75. Benjamin Franklin was the framer of the U.S. Constitution at the age of 81. Um, Dr. Jonathan Goforth, the great missionary to China, wrote to his children on his 75th birthday and he said, You must not wonder at me, even at 75, eager to remain here in the high places of the field, for the opportunities of service were never greater, and the outlook for a great harvest never brighter than now. Polycarp, the great church father at the age of 86, refused to deny Jesus and went to die at the stake, saying, Eighty and six years I served him, and he has never failed me. Will I deny him now? I, I believe that the church needs the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience, the example, the testimonies, the prayers of our seniors. There are still people to encourage, to pray for, to witness to, and to share with in a way that only persons who have been there and done that can. So I want to say to people who are seniors, write some poetry, write some songs, you know, write some books, do some journaling of your journey so that um, those of us who are, haven't um, crossed that path yet can, can benefit from your journey. Minister to each other, um, do some mentorship, do, do some encouragement, do some intercession um, because God wants to use all of us across the spectrum from children to youth to adults. To seniors. He wants to use all of us in ministry. Um, and, and there's something that is really interesting about the body of Christ. Now, when you think about your human body, the members of your body are all the same age, your physical body. Um, your eyes and your ears came along at the same time. Your hands and your feet came along at the same time. Somebody will say, well, your teeth um, didn't come along at the same time that you were born, but they were, they were right there under the gums. They, they, they just came up later. But all the members of your body are the same age. That's the physical body. But the body of Christ is unique because when we talk about one body and many parts, the, this one body um, is the body of Christ, but the many parts have different ages. And that's the beauty of the body of Christ. Um, and, and, and many times... You, you have more than one person working in the same area of ministry and they have different ages. So, so this body of Christ is not a body that ages in the same way that your human body does and then becomes a body that is incapable of doing certain things because new people, new members are born into this one body. So the many parts continue. So yes, we are the body of Christ. And, and the beauty of this body is that this body will forever have children, 
youth, adults, and seniors as members, as parts of this body. So we are always in a position to get the job done only if we could just see the importance of being able to work together. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work if that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally, and as he wills. And Romans 12, 4 says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Amen. Ministry is for all of us. Doesn't matter your age. If you know Jesus, he will use you in your season to accomplish what he wants you to accomplish in your generation. And wherever you move, whenever you move to a new season of life, he'll use you there as well because you continue to be part of the body of Christ. I have a couple questions that I want to um, tackle just before we wrap up this evening. Um, we have a question, um, can a believer have more than one gift? And I want to say yes, a believer can have multiple gifts. Um, believers can have as many gifts as the Holy Spirit bestows upon them. But, but what I want to emphasize is use your gift. Use your gift. And this is going to come up when I look at the, the next question as well. Use your gift. Um, every gift is not your gift. So use the gift that you are given. The one that you feel passionate about. Um, and that passion is not driven by psychic rewards like, like viewership. Uh, and, and like um, people saying thanks to you and great job and all those things. But the thing that you know deep in your heart, uh, God seems to be calling you to. Um, you, there, there are persons who, depending on their area of ministry, may require a pool of gifts. There are some areas of, of ministry where you can't just have one gift. You need multiple gifts in order to be able to accomplish um, what you need to accomplish in this area of ministry. So some areas of ministry require a pool of gifts. Um, additionally, the gift you have today, maybe for this season, and then God gives you another gift that he wants to, you to carry in another season. So he gifts you today, and you use that gift. But tomorrow, um, in the next season, he wants you to do something else in ministry. So it doesn't mean that the gift that you begin with is um, the gift you will have forever and no other gifts will be bestowed. Um, there are times when um, God, God shifts you from one area of ministry to a next. And when he does that, he gives you the gifts that you need um, to operate in this ministry, area of ministry that he's calling you to. Um, and then later he may give you a completely new pool of gifts again because he wants you to operate. Now, now the gifts are not, um, you know, for us to, to start counting and say, oh, you know, I have eight gifts and Somebody say, oh, you only have two? Well, too bad. I, I am much better off than you are. It's not like that. Um, it's that God uses you in ministry. He gives the gifts severally. And we come back to that all the time as he wills. So a believer can have one gift. A believer can have multiple gifts. It all depends not on you, but it depends on the Holy Spirit. Question number two. You said that no gift is better than the other. But at the end of chapter 12, Paul says that we should covet earnestly the best gifts. Is this a contradiction? I want to say no, it's not a contradiction. You know, the word of God tells us to covet earnestly the best gifts. But, but this doesn't mean to collect gifts as though they were like fine pieces of art. You know, and, and you say, well, well, mine is better than yours. Because sometimes when we use the word best, 
We think of good, we think of better, we think of best, and we think of the ones that are best are the ones that are at the top. And, and so um, there, there are ranks of gifts. Uh, if it were so, it means that all that Paul would have said in the earlier chapter would have been a contradiction, but that's not what this means. It means that we are to function as a channel through which the gifts happen, to covet the gift that is um, most appropriately distributed through you um, to, to minister. Um, it, it, covet here means to yearn for it, to desire it, to, to desire the best gift for you. Not the best gift in comparison to other person's gift. S desire the best gift for you. All right? There's a gift that is the best or some gifts that are the best gifts for you. Not, not for your brother or your sister. They will covet, covet the best gifts for them. In other words, seek to operate in the gift that is yours. That's the best gift for you. Not a comparison between your gifts and my gifts. But seek to have covet. Seek to have those gifts that are the best ones for you. The ones that God has given to you. Grab hold of them and use them well. Um, those are the ones that you have to covet, that you have to stir up. Not my brother's gift. Mine. My brother's gift is not the best gift for me. My gift is the best gift for me. Because the Bible says that God gives the gifts, distributes them severally. And as he wills. In other words, he gives you the gift that is the best gift for you. And he gives me the gift that is the best gift for me. All right? And that's the one that I need to covet. Not my brother's gift. And I think that, that, that all of it ties into what Paul was saying earlier. To one is given this and to another is given this. So covet the best gift for you. Not the gift that is for your brother. Um, don't go after that. Because you will be a mis misfit in the body. You're, you're not going to get a lot of success in your area of ministry because you're going to be ministering not in your area of giftedness. So if we were to classify the gifts um, and then decide which ones are best and desire those, it would make a mockery of God and his omniscience. But God gives you the best gift for you. Covet that gift. Go after that gift. Grab hold of that gift and use that gift. That's the idea that Paul was putting forth here. Um, when he says this at the end of the chapter. Now, I just want to encourage you to send your questions. C-O-G Silversands at gmail.com. Um, send your questions here so that we can have some time to interact around these questions. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight for World Changers Bible Study. Next time, we're going to be looking at the when of ministry. When is ministry done? We, we, we already touched a little bit on this. But we got some um, great truths that we want to share with you the next time that we look at the when of ministry. Um, Paul told Timothy, minister in season and out of season. We're going to spend some time looking at that. Um, is there a season for ministry and a season um, not for ministry? We're going to talk about um, ministry seasons. When is ministry to be done? We're going to talk a bit about that in our next session. So I want to encourage you to be with us again um, next time for World Changes Bible Study. May God bless you. Um, and I just want to challenge you as well to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Spend some time reading there and also spend some time in Romans chapter 12 and allow God to speak to you about your gift and about your ministry. May God bless you and I'll see you next time.